pretty, but I don't recall anyone mentioning any other attempt uh, of uh, an organization or people coming together uh, to start a, uh, an organization that was concerned uh, about black museums and black cultural organizations and similar problems that we face. Uh, no one mentioned uh, anything Barry Dickens, uh, John Dickens. Uh, so we simply didn't know of them. Uh, we didn't know of any prior attempt to form such an organization. Back to like Barry and then yeah, the Yeah, I would like to make a couple of observations. I attended the uh, Detroit meeting in 68. Uh, and there was an uh, association of There was a continuing organization from that, but I did attend the conference, and I knew that, and I think that's where I met, especially in the historical association, because my own interest had been principally towards the visual arts. Now, in terms of the New York-based organization,
At that point, Tom decided that he would not like to continue to chair these meetings. Because Tom had taken the initiative pretty much to chair them. The meetings had gone to different places, but they had been principally based at storefront. Tom had provided the mailing and had incurred real cost in the logistics up to that point. And I was asked to, to chair that, to try to move it on to the next level. At that point, in, in my own institution, we became so desperately pressed for our own economic viability that I really was not able to address that and to do more with it. So not much more was done with it than that, and occasional discussions with Mark or someone else whom I had occasion to either see or to talk to. I think that that's probably a fair description of where that particular organization stood <coughs> and what its relationship was to other possible organizations. Now, as it happened, the Detroit conference, I remember, was in late May, I think, somewhere in there. And I remember that, that I had gone to the first and Dr. Wright had written to say there was a second one and there was an opportunity to put in items into the agenda and so forth and so on. And I had planned to go to that, except my center does its largest fundraising event early in June, and I'm rarely at liberty to be gone in that timetable. So I didn't go, and I wrote afterwards to Dr. Wright to ask him what had happened at the meeting in order to have an idea of whether something had developed there that we ought to be plugging into, because we think of our institution as an important and viable one, and we would not like to think that there is an activity whether historical or art, in orientation, in which we are not a part. So I got back just some notes, programs and so forth from Dr. Wright, but no uh, description of any further action coming out of that. And then about uh, two weeks ago, maybe a little less than that, I received the notice of this conference. So I said to myself, how is it that we didn't know about this? So I asked my assistant to find out what she could about the meeting. So she called and I believe she spoke to you, uh, Harriet Kennedy. And her report to me was that this group of meetings were a product of the Detroit meeting. So when other people asked me where what I decided to go so suddenly, I which had drawn out of the Detroit meeting. Then shortly after that, I got a correspondence uh, with an agenda from John Pennard, and I simply said, if there's going to be a meeting at about black museums, then I don't see that I have a choice but to go. And that was pretty much you know, the understanding of both how Namco, which has not been uh, active in a real sense of the word, since I have chairman of it. That's how, that's pretty much how I saw its relationship to this. And it's also how I saw the immediate relationship of my own institution. As a point of personal view, my own feeling is that there certainly is a great need for everybody to have a very real communication. And that the history of museums up the largest sector of black museums should not exist in isolation from the museums which are arts oriented. The agenda program said black history museums. So I just discarded the history section because I didn't see that we could talk about it without those two things intermeshing. So I would think that an organization which identifies a way to function is the important thing. With, uh, with, with NAMCO, we had a lot of discussions. Tom had some thoughts about places where we might be able to find support in New York. We met with uh, some people, including Harry Potter, the Metropolitan, and so forth and so on. And we did deal with a lot of problems, but we did not, in the end, come out with money. And as you doubtlessly know, it's difficult to have impact, even of this sort unless there is 
is some money coming from somewhere that supports the logistics to achieve it. Mr. Henderson, then. Do I stand? No. no. You start to talk. You know, all of us came from great distance. Right? I think the gentleman here from Texas, a lady from Kansas. And, and I think this part of the program is for one hour. And it's obvious that we came this great distance to talk about black museums coalescing. That is the purpose. And the initial thing is to establish some communications uh, uh, system for all of these various organizations to discuss whatever they want to discuss this day on, today, that's number one. And then we can talk about, you know, what, what kind of organization we're gonna have, and et cetera, because time's not gonna permit us to really formulate anything. And the primary interest, obviously, is that we all recognize the need for perhaps not a singular organization, but we have the need to talk with each other so we can find out how we can all benefit Experiences, existence, etc. And this one philosophical thought. I, I spoke to some people, university students, recently. Uh, I made an observation. In the history of uh, Americans in this country, blacks in track, that's fast the same going. From 440 down, you can hardly beat them. And they're pretty good in 880. But when you get above that, so little endurance. I don't know. Great Milo is black. Great Milo? Of course, the Ethiopian. In America, he's an Ethiopian. He's a I'm not speaking about Africa, and we're here. You understand what I mean? We're talking about something. Can we endure if there's something that takes five years, ten years, and takes planning and programming and thinking? Can we endure? Can we stay in there? Do we have that? Now, we can make a dash. And if we can't do it yet, let's find out how it's done and prepare ourselves. So now we're all here together today. Let's start talking about the ingredients that are going to keep us together. Thank you very much.
No, I beat a dead horse. I mean, we all understand that already. And I don't see any reason why we should go over and over and over that idea when that is the intent, not only would I assume of NAMCO, but the intent of this organization too. We should simply proceed together. Right, right here first and then Tom. Let me just say one word. Uh, when Byron uh, brought the proposal to the organization, it was only that uh, he felt that the government would not fund give you enough money so everybody could come. So he, uh, this is my understanding was that everybody was welcome. It just happened to be that uh, at the time when he wrote the proposal, that six, six that would have took with me a Gambian student. And then we went in there, and I, I will try to compress very quickly. I heard in Africa, first of all, they were, it didn't bother them at all. They said, of course that means Gambia River. They were, they were surprised they won't even question such a thing and felt we ought to know this. And then there in the Gambia, for the first time I heard of, became aware of how black history is kept in Africa by the old men who are called griots. It's spelled G-R-I-O-T-S. They are in effect like walking, living archives. These are the men who have been trained from early childhood, early teenage, I should say, in the keeping of one particular piece of the African history. A line of griots might be an old man 20, uh, of, I'm sorry, of 70 years of age, and underneath him are successively younger men, like 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, as a teenage boy. And the boy studying under the older men will have been exposed to this story 40, 50 years before he is trusted to be the incumbent griot. These men, one line will specialize in one particular family clan, another, another family clan, so forth and on, like Smith, Jones, Johnson here. And they can talk, some of them, literally for two, three days and never repeat themselves, telling the history of a family clan. You see, that astounds us because in our society, in our culture, we have become so used to the crutch of print We've almost forgotten what the human memory is capable of holding if it's trained, as it is in Africa, to be the, 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 the repository of history. And I was, in, I was put in touch, finally, with a man. I had to get a little safari together and go up to a backcountry village and put in touch with an old griot, his name Keba Kenga Fofana, and he told me the history of the, Kunt, of the Kinte clan. One of the most awesome things I know, have come to know, now is that if any black American, if you only could know a few vital clues, which it is almost impossible for us to know simply because of the things which have happened in the intervening period, but if it were possible for almost any black American to know what was the African name of your ancestral forebear, about when were they brought out of Africa, and from about where were they brought out of Africa, that to this day it is not impossible that somewhere, or not improbable, that somewhere in backcountry black West Africa is a wizened old black griot who literally could tell you the ancestral clan from which you came. This man, Keba Kinga Fofana, knowing I came from the Kinte clan, he being an expert in that clan, telling the ancestral history of the clan in the meticulous detail they do tell it, told me about how the Kinte clan, and I stripped now what I tell you out of maybe five hours of talk, he told how the Kinte clan had been begun in the country called Old Mali. A branch moved into the country called Mauritania. From the country of Mauritania, a son of the clan, his name Kareba Kunta Kinte, a marabou, which is to say a holy man of the Muslim faith, the people there then and today being predominantly the Muslim of faith, this man came to the Gambia. He stopped in a village called Pakalinding. He went next to a village called Jifarong. He went next to a village called Jufare. And in the village of Jufare, he took his first wife, a Mandinka maiden whose name was Cyrene. And by her, and they used the biblical expressions, he begot two sons whose names were Jeanne and Salum. Then he took a second wife named Yesa, and by her he got a son named Omaro. The three sons grew up in that village until they came of age. The elder two went away and founded a new village called Kinte Kunda Jane Ya. The youngest of them, Omaro, stayed there until he had 30 reigns, the African way of saying 30 years of age, one rainy season a year. Then he took a wife, a Mandinka maiden whose name was Binta Keba. And by Binta Keba, roughly between the decade we would de designate 1750-1760, were born four sons in the order of their arrival, Kunta, Lamin, Suwadu, and Madi. 
Now, all through this long narrative, out of which I've stripped just essence, he would tell when he named some begot or other details about them, any kind of little innocuous things sometimes, or sometimes momentous things. When this man named the four sons Kunta, Lamin, Suwadu, and Mahdi, he stopped, he spoke through the interpreter as he had been, and the words came to me, about the time the king's soldiers came, the eldest of these four sons, Kunta, went away from this village to chop wood, and he never was seen again. And I had grown up in Henning, Tennessee all my life, hearing about this African who said his name was Kinte, saying he was chopping wood when he'd been kidnapped and captured into slavery. And that was what put it together. The rest of it from that time has been altogether, I guess about seven years of research in terms of before the actual writing, which I'm now deep, deeply into. The research took me into one of the things that's most vital when you talk about slavery at all. We oftentimes don't think about, don't reflect upon, it's no particular pejorative thing, we just don't, that slavery in fact was a maritime institution. So my leanings went now to the maritime side of it. I had been 20 years in the U.S. Coast Guard, that's where I learned to write. I knew a lot about ships, and I got curious what ship brought him. I knew where he had been brought because the grandmother, my grandma and all the others used to say they brought him to Annapolis. There was no place in the world they could have meant but Annapolis, Maryland. <laughs> I knew where he had left now because I knew where he left from was the Gambia River. I went into England, went in this, I knew it, was, it had happened before this country was a country was in colonial period. I went into England, I searched in 1,023 packets of slave ship records to find the specific ship that left Gambia River and went to Annapolis, Maryland. The thing I brought with me today is the best way I can think to try to illustrate some of the things, the documents. The first, the greatest find after I found the family itself, after seven weeks of research in London, was this particular document. I just, you can't really see them except to see what they saw. Um, this document, which is uh, a return of return of the shipping, arrived at and sailed from James Port, Gambia River, commencing May 4th, 1766. And I found this in London. Um, and the ship was number 18, the Lord Ligonier, Captain Davis. She had 170 tons burden. She had arrived in, uh, in the Gambia River, September the 13th, 1766. She sailed July 5th for Annapolis with 140 slaves. Then when I found that record, I went straight away to Annapolis, searching now for the ships coming into Annapolis. And then, would you, I sure would appreciate it, sir. And this is the, uh, the uh, entry records as she came in, and I was searching now, going into one set of records that you can always find back to the time of Christ as tax records, to find that, <laughs> yeah. Um, what did she come in port with? And I found that of the cargo that she had left Africa with, and I found another thing gave her cargo more in detail, that she entered Annapolis with the same cargo that she left Africa with, except that where she had left Africa with 140 slaves on July 5th, she arrived into Annapolis on September 29th, 1767, with the same thing she left Africa with, except that now she had 98 slaves alive. 42 had died. One of the passing, that was about average for slave ships, and one of the things I might make is just a side commentary, and I'm probably running over there, I can't help it, you know, go ahead. All right. uh, <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that's interesting as a side note is that the average slave ships lost about, say, from a third to a fourth of the slaves. But the reason that the English abolished slavery was not solicitude for slaves, as we would know, but it was the fact that more whites, percentage-wise, died on those ships than did slaves. The same ship that Lord Ligonier left graves in England with 36 in her crew, and she arrived in Annapolis with 18 alive. So they lost more crew than they lost slaves. Slaves had value, crew had no value. Once they had gotten the slaves on board, they would try to do things to make the crew try and commit suicide or anything so they wouldn't have to pay them. 
It was a totally brutalizing experience across all the way. Another thing that was found as a document, once I had found she came in here, was I knew that whenever you had something as valuable as slaves, then as today, you advertised. And I went into the media of the day, the microfilm records of the Maryland Gazette, and found the issue of October 1st, 1767, and on page two, the fourth ad down was the Lord Ligonier's ad. And she just arrived in the ship Lord Ligonier with Captain Davis, a cargo of choice healthy slaves, so forth. And the, the, the uh, agents of the ship were John Ridout, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer. Many of you may have seen an article that was in the uh, New York Times Magazine last summer, and they used that ad as the cover of the article. And um, an interesting little commentary is that the agent of the ship, John Ridout, this being in 1767, when the article came out, among the about 4,000 letters that came right away from the article, uh, was one from a young lady who told me that with great, great upset that she had discovered that she was directly descended, her name is Ridout, and she was a direct descendant of this John Ridout, and she wanted forgiveness. And uh, <laughs> so, so I told her, she, was in, uh, she is in England at the moment studying, a graduate student, so I, I wrote and told her that, you know, the first time I was over there, we would get together and discuss it, and see what, <laughs> what could we arrive at, you know, and see, see what, what we'd do. And, uh, um, then there was finally uh, one, in terms of just documentary research, there was one thing that uh, uh, played a sizable role, and that was that, um, again, in the oral history, and it's so important to try and stress how rigidly, exactingly kept oral history can be if kept well. And I don't think there are any people on the face of earth who have kept it better than black people simply by the nature of the survival of black people, that it was necessary for them to keep that very well. There are scarcely any of us here who have made, who if we have had occasion to talk with our grandparents or other old people, don't remember the meticulous detail in which they could tell something, particularly for some reason, old women. I don't know why that is, but an old woman may not be able to remember what happened last week very well, but she can tell you exactly what happened when she was eight years old. I'm sure you've had that experience. But they had said to me that Speaking of what had happened in the 1760s, they had said this slave was bought by Moss John Waller, and then later he was bought away from Moss John by Moss John's brother, Moss William Waller, and that had been something I heard when I was four or five years old. Now, 35 some years later, he, that story an echo from the past, corroborated by Cousin Georgia. Uh, I went to the archives in Richmond, Virginia, the legal deeds of the state of Virginia. And I went searching in the records of Spotsylvania County with a great confidence in how accurate indeed oral history was if properly kept, and with a knowledge that slaves having the value which slaves had generally, generally were records of legal, uh, legal records even if they involved families. And I searched and searched and finally did, found this, uh, finally did find this deed, two pages long, dated September 5th, uh, fifth day of September in the year of our Lord, 1768. It was a year after that slave had been brought over. And the deed is between John Waller of the county of Spotsylvania and his wife on the one part, and William Waller of the county, the brother of John, on the part of the other part. And they are transferring goods between them. And on the second page is between two commas among the goods being transferred and also one Negro man slave named Toby. And always Grandma and had said that they had given him the name Toby, this slave. So that was a documentation of that down to the legal deed. Um, when I went to Africa, the people whom I met, I've, I've told you of the old griot, the man who told the story. I wish I had a better picture of him, but I don't have one right now, uh, a lighter one. But the griot is Keba Kenge Fofana, is 76 years of age now. He was, um, at the time, he was 72. Have you got a thumbtack? Yeah. That man is um, the griot, Keba Kenge Fofana. When the book is published next year, I have plans, among other things, to bring Keba Kenge Fofana to this country with an interpreter. And I was talking just the other day with Johnny Carson, with some of the other people. We intend to put him on the biggest shows in this country with an interpreter. When you talk about black history, that is black history. 
that kind of man. Um, the, yeah. Things that have happened subsequently, and some very, no few, very heartwarming things have happened. I go back and forth now to the village, which I knew, I know is my ancestral village frequently. I have two brothers, George and Julius, both of whom who live here in Washington. Uh, George is in the USIE just as recently, and uh, Julius is an architect in the Navy Department. And we, of course, are very, very moved by uh, all of this which has happened, and we want to try and do meaningful things one thing we've decided is that village, um, we want to um, give to it and to the adjoining villages. They are Muslim people. We are Methodists, but that has nothing to do with the fact that that is our heritage. Um, we want to give to them, and we are going to give to them, a new mosque as a, as a token from us to them from whence we came. And the way things, the way the good Lord works these things, the youngest of us is an architect, and he's going over to design that mosque. Uh, more recently, I've been in negotiation with the people of the Gambia, and there are some areas in the Gambia, small areas, which have been designated as what is called freehold land. That means it may be owned by someone other than the government itself. Most of Africa's land is just owned by the government, you know, and you cannot own it. But around the village of Jufere, there is freehold land, and I am negotiating to buy that land to make of it a Kinte Memorial Park area for several things that we hope to do there, all of, of helpful nature. I just have, there's no point really putting them up. You've heard about the, the baobab trees. This is from the Gambia River where the slave ships ran, the baobab tree by the trail that runs up to the home village. The village itself is here, just a simple, another little village in backcountry Africa, the same way everybody out here who is black, there is some village that says ancestral, no less for you, if you only could know the clues. And this is sort of the, the the specific Kinte, fan com uh, Kinte clan compound within the village, that is the area occupied specifically by that clan, the elder and his descendants. This, the island, James Island Fort, from which the slave ship ran, this is James Fort. It's about 40 minutes boat run out in the river from the village of Jufere's wharf. Um, there's a, the, the women in the, this, this is the first time I went there and many times subsequently, just my sheer love, the, the, the mother of Kinte who was brought here as a slave, his mother was named Binta Keba Kinte. This is the today version. This is Binta Kinte in the village of Jufere today now with her grandson. Binta Kinte and I are six cousins. The thing it was possible to do, it was very easy to do once I'd found the family, is they know the lineage incredibly well. And they simply got together the people who were the, uh, the direct descendants of the three blood brothers born between 1750 and 1760. I had descended from the eldest of them. The others had descended from the younger two. And so we were, ergo, six cousins. It was just that I was the one who had left. I couldn't tell you a thing. There is nothing more heartwarming for me than that today. The people in the Gambia, don't know me as Haley, except for the people high up in the government or something like that who've been that educated. But in the back country now, when I get off a plane, if I go in by plane to Yundum Airport, or if I drive in from Dakar, Senegal, from the time I get to the, the, the boundary marker, the police post at the boundary marker, everybody calls me Mr. Kinte. And there's just something that there's no, no thing could make you feel greater than that. And I kind of feel, I have to conclude somewhere, and I guess it may as well be now. Um, I kind of feel that uh, there's a lot of living history is the feeling I have about this whole business because we're involved in lots of things. For one thing, when Larry was got, when we began this evening session, the afternoon session, Larry was saying he is being helpful to me. Well, he's being most modest. Larry is sort of the rock of Gibraltar of a motion of, of uh, project that we have on the way called formerly the Kinte Library Project. And what that comes from is that as a result of the work that I have been doing, becoming pretty widely known, and the impending book, uh, I should also tell you that it is already planned. There will be following the book, which will be in three volumes. It's a very, very long book. There, uh, the motion picture rights of it have been negotiated. There'll be a very major picture made four hours in length. We'll be shooting in Africa next year and in this country 
for about a year and a half to tell the first time the way it really was, the black saga, as it's best possible to interpret it. Um, as one result of this already, the Carnegie Corporation of New York has taken great, great interest in a thesis I had presented there that this country needs badly a black genealogical library. There is none up to this point. And so they, were, they did liberally fund a pioneering effort to feel the way into that. And our project director of that is Lawrence Reddick. And we are very proud to have him as such because of his own expertise and experience in this whole field. And I feel that is part of the living history. I feel also no less that this very conference in which we sit is living history. <coughs> I found myself thinking sitting there that I wish that uh, the grandmothers of all of us who are in here and the grandfathers, I wish they could be up there around looking because you see, no matter how much it may mean to us to be here, there's not one of us it could mean as much to as it would mean to them to watch us here, knowing what they endured, what they went through to make it possible for us to be here now. And I kind of think in terms of the physical conference, what's happening, it takes my mind back to one of the truisms I know about history, although I'm not a scholar, far from it, um, is that it afflicts all of history, is that overwhelmingly, predominantly, history has been written by the winners. And that distorts it from the beginning. As a tangential aspect, history also has been recorded by the winners. It has been stored by the winners, so forth. That is why we find ourselves here now preoccupied with how can we find black history as a derivative entry in white historical records, so to speak. And what we're doing here now, I think, I feel, I know that, symbolizes that Although this has been the case of history written by, recorded by, stored by, so forth, the winners, now we are seeing in a physical form, and I suspect probably for the first time in the history of this particular institution, and great institution it is, the National Archives, the opening of the door, and more important, the opening of the attitude that now the black history needs to become and shall become a real viable part of telling the history of this nation. Thank you much.